welcome to a new episode of the Tranquility Du Jour podcast, bringing you tranquility since 2005. Tranquility Du Jour is a series of nourishing conversations about living a full and meaningful life with doses of tranquility. Now, before we dive in, I just want to let everyone know how much I am thinking of you as we navigate this new normal, these tricky times. I also want to say a big thank you to those of you who tuned in to last week's Zoom call and then last night's Tranquility Du Jour Live. It's been so nice to connect as a community as we navigate all of this. And for those of you who missed the Zoom call last Monday, I'll put a link to it in the show notes which can be found at KimberlyWilson.com slash 483. And I created also a PDF that I will also put in there. It just has some tips for navigating emotional, mental, physical, and then societal um, ways kind of during all of this. And so hopefully that'll be helpful. Again, you'll find that over in the show notes. And of course, TDJ Live will be available for replay. The replay will be available later today, and that'll be over on our Tranquility Du Jour Live page. I'll also put a link to that in the show notes. And I just want to say again, thinking of you all as I know this is a really trying time for everyone. And please know I'm here to support and doing all I can to offer lots of helpful resources and kind of love from afar. So thank you again for tuning in. In this week's edition of Tranquility Du Jour, I'm chatting with Christy Hugstad about the loss of her husband, depression, and how to help someone in crisis. Now, if you're new to Tranquility Du Jour, there is a link also in the show notes that'll take you on over to the website where you can learn a little bit more. I also wanted to mention that I am hosting the first virtual retreat that I've done in a couple of years on Saturday, April 4th from 12 to 3. Would love to have you join, and it's a really delightful way to kind of drop into an experience of a retreat, but without leaving your home, which we kind of can't right now. But the idea behind it is how do we reset connect and create together. We'll also be doing, of course, a seated yoga practice, a mindfulness practice, creative play and reflection. And if you've been on any of my virtual retreats before, you know kind of what you're in for. They're a really nice way to connect because we will be doing this via Zoom. So it'll be via video. People can have their videos on and you can see each other or you can, of course, have that off. But It allows us to really, I think, connect in a different way. And also, I just wanted to read to you one testimonial from someone who had joined in the past. The virtual retreat is exactly what I needed during this busy time of the year for me. As an introvert with an extroverted job and tendencies, it was wonderful to give myself the opportunity to check out for the day while still being in my own space. I lit candles and incense put on soothing jazz, and spent the whole day in my comfiest clothes, virtually connecting with my favorite yoga and mindfulness guru. (laughs) So sweet. I also love that we will always have access to the modules. I've been on a few retreats with Kimberly and leave wishing I could take it all with me. Now I can. So I love that because, you know, the idea behind this really is to make this a retreat experience. And I also wanted to mention, if you've been financially affected by what's going on in the world and it's preventing you from joining us, email me and I'll send you a complimentary code to join. Also, a portion of all proceeds will benefit Pigs and Pugs Project and Meals on Wheels to help seniors stay safe amid the virus. Christy Hugstad is the author of Beneath the Surface, a teen's guide to reaching out when you or your friend is in crisis. Ever since her husband completed suicide in 2012, after years of struggling with clinical depression, she dedicated her life to helping abolish the stigma of mental illness and suicide. A certified grief recovery specialist and a grief and loss facilitator for recovering addicts, She frequently speaks at high schools. She's also the host of the Grief Girl podcast that I've also linked to in the show notes and lives in Orange County, California. Visit her online at thegriefgirl.com. Welcome, Christy. Hi, thank you so much for having me on the show. 
Absolutely. So tell us what inspired you to write this new book, Beneath the Surface, a guide to reaching out when you or your friend is in crisis. Well, about seven years ago, my husband, Bill, died by suicide. He ran in front of a train in Dana Point, California, where we lived. And after his suicide, I I was going through such a dark time myself. And I thought, you know, I've got two choices that I can make here. I can either be a victim of the tragedy and struggle on a daily basis just to get out of bed, or I can take my pain and do something with it to help other people so they never have to be in that dark place that I was experiencing. So, you know, it was a no-brainer. I just decided, you know what, I am going to get out there and do what I can to make a difference, to teach people the warning signs and risk factors of depression and suicide so nobody has to experience what I did. So to do that, I thought, you know, I need to start with our teens, with our youth, so that they grow up in a culture where where talking about their mental health is commonplace. You know, just like if you broke your arm, you wouldn't lie in bed for a couple of weeks and hope that it heals, right? I mean, you would go to a medical professional and get the treatment that you need for your specific disease or injury. And that's what needs to happen with our mental health as well. So to get rid of that stigma, we need to start with our young people so they grow up in a culture that isn't being judgmental and then they'll feel free to reach out and get help. Yeah, I love the idea of really honing in on, okay, if you have a broken arm, you don't just like hope it's going to get better. You know, you go see a professional. And as a therapist, I appreciate what you're saying, because I do think it's so important that you, that mental health is, um, and I think this is, it's happening slowly, but it's happening that people are really like taking into account, like this is an important part of who I am. Well, absolutely. And you know, you're right. It is happening and it is happening so slow, but because of that slow pace, it's costing lives, you know, and that's why I'm so passionate about, about, about educating, you know, adults, teachers, administrators, teens, everybody to get all of us on the same page. So we all know the risk factors and warning signs, and we can all help each other because we are all in this together. What have you learned since your husband's death? Well, that's an interesting question. I guess I guess the biggest thing I've learned is I was on such a mission to fix him that my focus was getting that right mental health professional, that psychiatrist, psychologist, the church counselor, the the um, self-care person, that magic pill that would bring Bill back to the man that I married. And what's really hard for me to own is when I look back, you know, Bill bought into that stigma. He never, ever owned that he had major depression. He never said, Christy, I need help. He never reached out. And in a way, I bought into that stigma as well because my main focus was to get him back to the man that I met and the man that I married. And now I realize, and I've learned a you know really hard lesson, is that he had a disease. He had major depression. And that was probably something that the two of us together were going to battle for the rest of his life. And I was so on a mission to find that fast, quick cure. And that that's just, you know, not what was happening in in Bill's brain. Right, right. And were you aware of the depression when you met him? Absolutely not. No, he was great at hiding it when he needed to. Um, I didn't see signs of it until actually after we were married. And then that irritability and the isolation and he became a little more withdrawn. And to me, it happened so gradually, but I think he always had the depression. He just tried his best not to distribute those signs in front of me. So no, I didn't know that when I met him. 
Right, right. It's not like somebody walks around with a sign, you know, it's like, I right. am just, yeah, yeah. And you know what, he he died at 54. And at that point, he had already bought into the stigma that that was shameful. And I think he grew up as a young boy. I think he was raised to think that mental illness or emotions are a sign of weakness, especially for men. You know, it's interesting you say that because I remember having my father, he came into my therapy space recently and um, he was like, what do people talk about here? You know, because I just wanted to show him my office. And then he's like, what are the tissues for? You know, it's like not even aware of like what happens when people actually talk about these things called emotions, you know, and I think, yeah, it's not something that is encouraged, you know, as a child or as an adult where it's like, so tell me, how are you feeling? It's like, buck up. Right. And, and for your father to say, why, what's with the Kleenexes? You know, are people crying in here? What kind of job do you have? But that is really indicative of different generations and what they think of emotions and mental illness. And, you know, when I think back to, I remember Bill's father sitting down with the two of us and saying, you know, Christy and Bill, I just want you to know that Bill's both of his grandmothers had a suicide attempt. And I remember at the time thinking, yeah, well, what does that have to do with anything? And as his father was telling us that story, he had tears streaming down his face. And I guess I'm really shocked now that I didn't put two and two together that family history and there's a genetic component to depression. And I didn't connect the dots until it was too late. Yeah, it's, uh, it is interesting, that genetic component, isn't it? Because um, I think it's always scary that when you find out it's in your family, and right, you look at like, say the Hemingways, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's an interesting, you know, piece on the nature versus nurture on how this actually shows up. And I think people don't think that it can happen to them, or that it's, it's happening inside their family, that kind of thing is something that happens in other families. And I think for most of us, if we take a look at our aunts and uncles and our family history, and we start to kind of pay attention to what mental health issues are in our gene pool, uh, for most of us, there is some forms of mental illness in our family history. Absolutely. I mean, it's definitely there for all of us, you know, it's uh, whether or not people were aware of it, um, but it's there for sure. Now, what is the most important thing that someone experiencing a crisis should know? When you're, when you're in a crisis mode, you have to understand that it's not something that you can, should, or, or are able to take on yourself. So when you yourself are in a crisis mode, The most important thing is to reach out and get help. And as I said earlier, you know, your depression, your suicidal ideation, you can't just hope it passes and maybe you're going to wake up tomorrow and it's going to be gone. You need to get help immediately. And what's the first step for that that you recommend? Depending on the level of crisis, if you just know that you are, your depression is not lifting and it's going on day after day, my first recommendation is to reach out to a mental health professional and let the professional figure out what treatment works for you and your uniqueness as a person and what you're experiencing. If the crisis is to the point where, like where my husband was, for example, where you have a plan and you are going to carry out that suicidal plan, then you need to dial 911 and get emergency help right away. And I think one of the pieces that's so challenging about this, and you know, a lot of my clients will say, oh, I tried to go to the uh, school clinic or, you know, college kind of counseling center, but there's a two month wait list, you know, and so it is, it can be so tricky, I think, with regard to mental health care. But, you know, one thing to keep in mind, right, is the, um, the crisis lines that are available 24 seven. Well, and you know, that's, it's what works for one person may not work for somebody else. I know for my husband, the last thing he would have ever done in his 
you know, suicidal mindset would, would be to call an 800 number and talk to a stranger that I don't think would ever have occurred to him because I think he'd already made up his mind. You know, that may work for somebody else. There's also a text hotline that, you know, if you don't want to speak to somebody one-on-one, you can actually do it through text. So there are different methods of reaching out depending on what's comfortable for you. What would you say are some coping strategies um, for people struggling with depression? I think the most important thing is that you have to be patient with yourself. You have to realize that this is going to take some time. You have to understand that your depression is a disease and there is treatment. And when you understand that it's a disease and there is treatment, that gives you hope that you will feel joy again. So I think the first step is education and acknowledging that what you have is treatable because it is a disease. From there, once you understand that, you have to start taking care of yourself because what happens when you're in that depressive state is that your dopamine levels are so low that you're probably struggling even to get out of bed, much less go to work or take care of the kids or you know, whatever it is you need to get on with your day. So in order to raise the dopamine levels naturally, you need to get outside. You need to move, get some exercise, get out in the sunlight and the fresh air, get some vitamin D, eat healthy. So the, all those things fall under practicing self-care. And that is what the disease of depression needs. And that is something you can do for your own self-care. And you need to start that immediately even when you don't feel like it. Right, right. Because the simple act of like getting it started, and I say simple, it's so hard. But you know, the act of like putting your feet on the floor, getting out of bed, you know, they're big steps. And yet they're such a simple thing to do that can have such profound effects. And at that point, when you can barely get out of bed, you probably will have to make lists of just small things that you think are doable throughout your day. I remember after Bill's suicide, I didn't take a shower or wash my hair for 10 days. It it was just too overwhelming and it required too much energy. And I didn't even think of it. You know, so I get when you're in a dark place and just making coffee or getting your child off to school is so taxing and overwhelming. So make a list of just little things, you know, because a lot of times, you know, you have intense brain fog and you're not even going to think maybe I should put some laundry in, or maybe I need to get, go to the store. I don't have anything for dinner. You know, the, the small things that you used to take for granted, sometimes those are the, the things that are overwhelming you. Absolutely. And, you know, what is interesting about all this to me is that you went on to become a certified grief recovery specialist. And so I assume you probably didn't have that training before this experience. Absolutely not. Bill and I were in the fitness business. We owned a very successful gym. I taught spinning and Pilates and he was a personal trainer and ran the weight room and we were in the fitness industry. And, um, so no, I was not in the counseling business, but you know, what really inspired me to help other people and become a grief recovery specialist is I've been there. And I think it's important if you're going to help people through their grief journey, you have to get it. You know, you have to understand depression, suicide. You can't be afraid of the topic of suicide. And since I'm not, because I've experienced that, it was uh, kind of just something I was real passionate about and still am. What would you say for people, like, uh, you know, some go-tos for people experiencing grief that may have lost someone to suicide or, you know, may have lost a pet, may have lost a job? You know, grief shows up in so many forms. And as a specialist, what are some tools that you recommend people do? I think the first thing and the biggest thing that I, I would like your listeners to know is that grief is a journey. It's not a destination. It's not like you're going to wake up one day and whew, I'm done grieving. I'm good to go. So it is something that is a long journey and you just need to pack your bags and go on that journey and the road's going to turn and swerve and go up and down and be okay with that. But I think 
if you think that there's a beginning and an end to your grief, it's going to be a lot harder for you to navigate because, you know, we've all been taught or are aware of the five stages of grief. And I think for me, when I realized, you know, that's not, that doesn't apply to me. My first, I wasn't in denial. You know, Bill had been struggling and talking about suicide for months. So I I knew that it was real and the stages didn't unfold neatly for me. And not only that, they repeated themselves and they still do. You know, I mean, I reached a point of acceptance, which is the first, the fifth stage. But then sometimes I go back and I get angry again. And sometimes I will think, did this really happen? And so it's important to understand that grief is not a linear uh, pattern. It doesn't unfold neatly into stages. And they're going to repeat and it's going to be a roller coaster ride. So I think it's important to know what to expect and to be patient with yourself because it's going to change over time, but there is no end to your grief. Absolutely. I think that's such a great reminder. And I don't know if you're familiar with Warden's Tasks of Grief. No. Oh, because I think this really resonates with people a little bit more than the stages. And there's four tasks. And, um, you know, it's like adjusting to the new normal, having some sort of, uh, you know, connection still to the person or being who's passed away, but yet moving on with life and um, accepting the reality of the loss, feeling the emotions. Those are the four stages or tasks. Right. And I just like this because it's not, you know, you don't start with the first one. Like they just, whatever happens, happens, but you want to work through those four in order to actually get through the process. And as you said, though, honestly, we're never through the process. I mean, you know, we can have losses from 20 years ago that we're still feeling incredibly viscerally. Well, yes. And I think, I think that's, a, that was beautifully put and, and, Really, I like to think of, instead of stages, just think of them as common responses to grief because they're going to be different for everybody. And when you when you pigeonhole stages, then you start to think, what's wrong with me? Because, you know, I'm not angry or I, I thought I was accepting, but, you know, now I'm bargaining and I'm in denial. And and, and I think, you know, tasks of grief or common responses I think are just a much better way of explaining what grief is all about. Absolutely. It's such a complicated being, isn't it? It is. But um, but I, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I, I you're and and I think what's so hard for people is, you know, you don't start studying or or learning these things until you're in it. You know, I never thought well, just in case I have to deal with any kind of tragedy or trauma in the future, I think I'm going to start researching, you know, what's the best way to journey through grief. You know, you're in it and you're you're starting to reach out and you're stu- you're starting to research things and you you start questioning yourself and thinking, am I normal? Am I going crazy? You know, do other people feel this way? So um, that's why I, I, I'm so not about teaching people stages. Right, right. No, I love that. I think there's definitely been a shift away from that, or it seems to be. And, you know, one of the other pieces um, that I'm curious about with regard to the grief process is the cumulative effects of grief. So one of the things I've read, and I, I feel like I personally experienced this, is that every loss builds on the other. Is that something that you um, worked with or learned kind of in your training? Absolutely. The cumulative grief is, you know, things, different things that are unexpected that you, that are a result of what has happened to you, your loss. And what I found found is I wasn't just grieving the loss of my husband. I had all kinds of secondary losses that I wasn't expecting. And that's when I started to question my own sanity because you know, suddenly we weren't gym owners anymore and I was the wife and now I'm the widow and I was in charge of, you know, making the dinners and suddenly there, I, there were no dinners. And so my whole role as Bill's wife and the roles that I had in our business 
And I mean, there, there was, it was like a um, domino effect of other secondary loss losses that I wasn't expecting. And I, I remember being at the DMV and, and it said marital status. And this was shortly after Bill died. And I thought, well, what am I? Am I, you know, am I a widow? Am I single? I really didn't know what to check because in my mind, I was still married. So, you know, there's so many things that happen that are secondary losses that go along with the primary loss. And I think it's important for people to realize it's not just about your loved one or your pet or whatever. There's a lot more that goes with that. And uh, that's real normal. Well, and I think, too, whenever you say secondary loss, um, I like that. I've never uh, kind of heard it put in that way, but it makes sense that it's, you know, even one of the things that's lost, say, with the loss of a pet, it's the routine. You know, you get yes. up, you feed the dog, and, you know, you make sure the dog's okay before you go to bed. It's like, you know, these uh, these book um, bookends of your day are removed, Yes, and I know, and, and I'm sure your listeners out there that have a broken relationship, they've gone through a divorce, you know, they've a, a spouse has died. Uh, my whole, entire circle of friends changed because we were used to going as a couple to dinner parties or to events, and in time, that stopped. And I had a whole new circle of friends that were single or, you know, so that was another loss that kind of blindsided me. And I think it's important for your listeners to know that expect that and that's okay, because I don't want to be at a dinner party with two other couples and me, you know, <laughs> that's, that's not fun for me anymore. So that's another loss that, that kind of blindsided me. Yeah, you know, I hadn't even thought of that. But of course, or, you know, say it's a pet, like going to the dog park, you know, you're probably not going to be doing that because that would be upsetting. And yet you may have a lot of friends there. Yeah, so it's all these different things that, yeah, you just don't think about um, that are uh -huh. constant reminders. Yes, yes. And there's triggers everywhere. And that's a tough one because, you know, it can be a smell. It can be, and I know for a lot of us, if a loved one has died, initially, I thought I saw Bill everywhere. I would look out into a crowd and I would see him. I remember going for a jog down at the beach and there was a man walking that looked exactly like him and it stopped me in my tracks. And I know I remember after my dad died, the same thing. I saw my dad everywhere. So there's a lot of things that will trigger you and remind you of your loss. And some of them are expected, but some of them will catch you way off guard. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's like you can't always have your armor up because you just don't know what's around the corner. So it is such a vulnerable place to be. It is. And you never know how you're going to react. You know, there are times when I will see somebody driving the car, the vehicle that Bill drove. Sometimes I'll smile and say, oh, that's a reminder of the love that I had for Bill. And other times I'll break down in tears. So, you know, your your reaction to the triggers can sometimes be all over the board and, and you don't even know how you're going to respond. Absolutely. Um, such good reminders with regard to the process. And, you know, one of the things that you talked a bit, uh, uh, quite a bit about in the book, which, you know, definitely, I know this book is catered to teens, but I think this is relevant for all of us is the social media smartphone addiction and how this contributes to depression, right? FOMO. And you see your like best friend is hanging out with your other friend and you weren't included and, you know, things along those lines. And so I'm just curious what tools you have for our listeners on ways to deal with that. Well, I think it's really important, you know, especially if you have kids, but you know what, we as adults are just as guilty. So you're right. Everything I write about in the book also applies to adults. The warning signs and risk factors are almost identical. But the thing about technology is it's so important to start to modify and restrict technology before it becomes an addiction. Because I deal with teens that are so addicted even, you know, 10 year olds, that if their technology, their phone is taken away from them, they'll cry and scream and throw a tantrum. And it's getting worse and worse because for our youth, their whole life is online. You know, they, they're, they go to school and if they're being bullied, it, 
it sometimes kicks up when they get home because now with technology, they're being cyberbullied and they don't have a safe place and they are exposed to technology and what's going on with their peers 24-7. And the hard thing too is, you know, at least for us, an adult brain, I know that what people post on Instagram and Facebook is not, you know, their entire story. But for teens that have an undeveloped brain, their whole world is their peers and what goes on at school. So if they see all of their friends together at social functions and they're not included and they're not getting likes on Snapchat or Instagram, that really is hurtful and really does a number on their self-esteem. And the more that they buy into that, the lower their self-confidence becomes. And sometimes that can lead to depression. So, you know, they're living in a whole different world of technology that a lot of us didn't grow up with. So that's why I think it's really important for parents to start to restrict it so that they are, so it doesn't become an addiction. Yeah. And what about for adults, though, on learning how to restrict it for ourselves? Well, what I will speak, <laughs> you know, I am just as guilty and I like to make excuses that a lot of my my business and professional life is on appointment. And I, so I have to check my phone every 10 minutes. But there are times when I'm home that there's nothing that urgent that can't wait for tomorrow. So I will turn it off. Right. And, you know, our youth are watching us. And if we are role models and we are on our phone 24 seven, and if we're sitting at the dinner table and we're all, everybody's on their phone, you know, we are setting a really bad example for our youth. So that needs to change. And we need to be on top of it ourselves. Yeah. I love screen. I love and hate screen time. Right. You know, the, uh, where iPhone will let you know how many times you picked up your phone today and, you know, how right. long you're on Facebook, right? It's just like, yeah. oh, Lordy, like, my, that's, that's my life. Prob- <laughs> and that's probably a good thing that it can be monitored because I think the statistics for most of us are quite shocking. Shocking. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it and, you know, sometimes like, of course, it includes email, um, which, you know, might not just be like, what's up? It's more along the lines of, you know, rescheduling appointments or what have you. Um, but, you know, of course, it, it tracks Google Maps or Waze or things like that. But, you know, the fact that it does break it down by apps, I think can be so interesting. And you look at it, and even if it's just like a, a couple hours a day, I mean, that is an entire day by the end of the week, you know, potentially an entire day of waking hours, you know, by the end of the week. And you're like, oh, my life, well, where is my life going? And really, when I break it down, maybe two hours of that time was actually used for business, right? And the rest is just probably, you know, entertainment or an escape from reality, you know, just like our teens are doing. But what's really become, it really becomes a problem. And I don't know if you do this or your listeners do this. When you are constantly checking your phone, even when it doesn't ring or vibrate, and there's actual an actual term for that called phantom vibration. You think that your phone vibrates when it has it, and that is becoming a real phenomenon. And that's when it starts to become a serious addiction, when you can't, you know, you can't be off your phone and you are waiting for that next engagement. And so you're checking your phone, even if it's not ringing. Right, right. Yeah. It's just, it's wild, right? The evolution of this, but you know, and it's real how it contributes to depression and feelings of isolation, et cetera. So on another topic that is a little more um, kind of uplifting um, as we round out our interview is how do we develop hope? The best way is to understand and have information about what it is that is going on in your brain. So in other words, if you are feeling a sense of sadness, but you're not sure if you're depressed, you have to realize that if that sadness isn't lifting for a couple of weeks or longer, and you have that dark cloud continually over your head, you are headed for depression. But the good news is that it is an illness and there is treatment. When you understand that, it gives you hope that you will have and will experience happiness and joy once again. So I think the key is you've got to know what is going on with your brain and start to 
practice self-care and reach out for help. And, you know, that is what will give you hope that your joy will once again return. Beautiful. Thank you. And my last question for you, Christy, is the name of this podcast is Tranquility Du Jour. And so how do you find tranquility in the everyday? Especially you know, with all uh, you've been through. <laughs> you know, I guess I I'm all about affirmations and and starting my day with positivity. So I always start my day with four or five things that I'm grateful for. And that actually does, if you be, if that becomes habitual, that starts to rewire your brain towards happiness and joy. So I think for everybody, it's important to start and end your day with positive affirmations, with things that you're grateful for and work on altering your brain chemistry. So that becomes an automatic response. And, you know, take a few deep breaths throughout the day and put things in perspective, get out in nature and just be appreciative of the beautiful life that you have. Beautifully said. Thank you so much, Christy, for sharing all of your wisdom. Thank you so much for having me. So you can find Christy at thegriefgirl.com at facebook.com slash thegriefgirl, twitter.com slash khugstad, H-U-G-S-T-A-D, and Instagram at thegriefgirl. There's also a link to the MP3 that I mentioned, which is a recording of last week's Zoom call, where I offered it up for us to gather as a community to chat about ways to curb anxiety right now, how to work from home, and then how to help and support others. There's also a link to the PDF that I mentioned at the beginning, which is filled with additional ideas, and then also a link to TDJ Live. If you have a moment to share a view of this podcast on iTunes or share it with a friend, I'd be so grateful. For more episodes of Tranquility Du Jour, visit KimberlyWilson.com slash podcast. You can also download the podcast app for iPhones and Androids, and there's a link in the show notes. Also, subscribe to Tranquility Du Jour podcast using your favorite podcast app, such as Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Overcast. I have a link to each of these also in the show notes. If you're not on my love notes, I send out a weekly love note straight to your inbox and it's filled with exclusive content, updates, giveaways, and more. Also gives you access to a plethora of multimedia resources and tranquil treasures. And again, there's a link for this in the show notes. There's a link also to my books, where to find me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Also, check out the Tea with Kimberly video series because last week I produced four additional ones kind of relating to helping us get through this time. There's also a link to Shop Tranquility, which is my locally sewn, eco-friendly fashion line. And then if you have a moment to share a review of this show on iTunes, or if you have a moment to share a review of any of my books on Amazon or Goodread, would be so grateful. And in turn, I'll send you a Sparkly Paris postcard. Details for this are at KimberlyWilson.com slash review. Wishing you a wonderful week ahead, sending you so much love. Please keep me posted on how you're doing, and I hope to see you on April 4th at our virtual retreat. Namaste. Thank you.